pond management and fish management. Well, thank you, Keith. I really do appreciate it. It's awesome to be able to get with you all tonight and appreciate everybody um, coming on board and, and listening to some of our pond information that we will present tonight. As Keith said, um, my preference is probably just a, I could have a Q&A session all night as far as I'm concerned. I do have a PowerPoint for you all and I've got several slides on here. Maybe some of them might be of interest to you, but if you have any questions at all, please, like Keith said, definitely put that in the chat and um, I'll stop at any time Keith stops me. I probably won't be able to see the chat very well, but Keith, you let me know if there's a question, I'll be happy to answer that and we'll take care of it as we go through here. I've got several slides that I'll present tonight, but um, again, I'm gonna try to move through these kind of quick and I would prefer to answer questions. So if you have anything, please uh, feel free to shout those out to us. I've got um, several things that the Upper Cumberland agents asked me to cover this evening. So I'm gonna try to go through all of those. Uh, some of those I'll go through quicker than others, but I wish to start with just basic pond management. And uh, anytime we think about pond management, I like to ask folks kind of what are their goals when they're putting together a pond or maybe they've even inherited a pond or possibly have bought a piece of property. It's got a, a nice fishing pond on it. Uh, what are your goals? Are you really wanting to just have good, real big, largemouth bass? I know that's something I, that interests me a lot, but it may not be of major interest to you. Maybe it's just that you want to have some real big, uh, nice bluegill in there, something maybe for your grandchildren, your children to fish. Uh, maybe you just like to eat fish, so maybe you just want catfish in there, but you need to establish what your goals are when you are uh, looking at managing a pond. And also, too, along with that goes a good plan. Anytime that you're going to either build a pond or, a, as I said, you've inherited one some way, somehow, um, you know, you need to come up with some sort of plan for that pond. If it's brand new, you need to decide on what a good location is for that pond. And not all places maybe on that piece of property that you own make the very best location for a pond. And these things are extremely costly. So, Make sure you know how big a pond you want to build. Make sure you know in your area who's a good person that can build that. Uh, not everyone, not every single contractor, not to step on anyone's toes here tonight, but not every contractor out there with a bulldozer is the right person to choose to build a pond. Also understand that there could possibly be some permits that are required by the state. Uh, usually TDEC, Tennessee Department of Environment and Conservation, manages those permits. And for the most part, in many areas, I find that it is not that difficult to really necessarily get a permit to build upon, as long as uh, it doesn't get extremely really large and you fall within certain, uh, certain rules and boundaries. Also too, uh, for whatever, uh, any kind of plan that you're putting together as far as pond construction, make sure that you do that correctly. Make sure you're doing it right and that you get with the right people. As you get into that construction phase on building a pond, uh, make sure that you, you know, do a good job at planning, maybe involve the Natural Resource Conservation Service in your area, possibly uh, work with TWRA, the Army Corps of Engineers. Also too, um, sometimes we can maybe provide some assistance in building, you know, your planning uh, part of it. As far as the major construction, a lot of these government agencies don't really wanna get majorly involved in it because there's some liabilities involved. So you're probably gonna to have to reach out to a private consultant in your area. And uh, sometimes I have a list of some private consultants in the state, but not necessarily do we have them uh, that are completely uh, cumulative for the entire state. So you might have to kind of reach out to some of those agencies that I mentioned, organizations and government uh, entities to find out who would be a good person to help you build upon. Um, as I said, a lot of times a permit is required. Uh, you usually are gonna need a permit if you're disturbing more than an acre of ground. So that means if the bulldozer is going to push an acre of ground to build a half acre pond, even though it's only a half surface acre large, you still are going to have to have a permit if you're disturbing more than an acre. And again, you'll need to reach out to the Department of Environment and Conservation. The site, um, again, you're probably looking at about an acre, most times, even if it's a small pond, it's going to be about an acre of ground. So be careful with that. Um, 
I don't really like to build a pond on top of a creek either. That's going to get you in trouble most times with TDEC. They don't like it when you disturb an existing creek or a blue line stream, we call it. Um, I definitely like to try to avoid springs, and I'm more than happy to answer any questions about that. Uh, as far as any kind of springs and why we don't really like to build a pond on top of a spring. And we're, we're more, I'm more than happy to answer any questions that someone might have or more discussion on it later. Uh, the soil is extremely important in the construction phase. Uh, obviously, it's better to have clay or silty, silty clay soil. Um, and the higher the percentage of clay is the, usually going to be the best uh, to be able to build a, a pond and also to pour the dam uh, to make sure that you get a good, uh, a real good clay bottom uh, that will hold water for you. And we get so many calls in extension. I know all of our offices get so many calls about leaks. And it's just too late a lot of times uh, when your pond starts leaking after a couple of years, after you've already spent a lot of money on these, it's just sometimes too late to do them correctly. So you definitely want a good clay or silty clay soil. And you need uh, roughly about five acres of watershed. That would be just pasture land for approximately one surface acre of water. So you're going to need about five acres of watershed around you in order to, uh, to be able to uh, accommodate just one surface acre of water. The other thing, too, is, is if you've got some wooded area around you, I would recommend at least about 10 to 12 acres. It could mean even more, maybe up to 15 acres of a wooded. Uh, wooded area in order to hold one surface acre of water. And again, that's going to vary depending on your soil, uh, maybe what kind of slope you have or any kind of vegetation that you would have around you there. Now, as far as stocking your pond, once you get it built, um, you need to put, uh, figure out kind of again, what is in your plan, what your stocking strategy is going to be. And in most of our ponds in this area, we're looking at basically a a bluegill and a red or and or a red ear sunfish or what we call shell cracker, along with the largemouth bass, which is the major predator in the pond. And then a lot of people like to put maybe catfish, which specifically you would want to put channel catfish in your pond. We'll talk a little more about the, the strategy of your of how you stock uh, in the next couple of slides. Um, if you go with that, uh, the typical pond where you're just going to stock bass, a largemouth bass specifically, and then put bluegill in there. Some people call them brim. You would want to stock those in the fall, uh, typically around September, maybe the first part of October is a real good time to stock the bluegill. This would be the very first fish that you would put in that pond as it's newly constructed. And then um, those bluegill are going to have time to become sexually mature for the next following spring so that you can go ahead and stock your bass about the first part of June. And that's, again, specifically largemouth bass. And that way they'll have something to eat. So they're gonna have some small, you know, by that time they would already gone through at least one, maybe two times of spawn where they would have already had some babies and those would be, those would be able to be, uh, they would supply the new bass that you put in. Those bass are gonna, they're born to eat fish. So they're gonna go ahead and start eating uh, as quick as you put them in. The ratio there would be, you always want to stick with this ratio, but you're looking to hopefully have about three to five pounds of bluegill to every pound of bass, and you would maintain that ratio. We call that a balance throughout the duration of your pond. Now, you can put your catfish in. That's, again, channel catfish is what we recommend. You can put those in anytime, uh, preferably before you stock the bass because they could eat they could, the bass could possibly eat the catfish. You can also stock at the same time. If you think you're gonna have heavy uh, aquatic vegetation, then you might go ahead and consider putting in some grass carp. Again, five to 10 of those, but definitely would wanna stock those with the bass or before you put the bass in. And uh, those are a sterile grass carp and um, they're not really, they're a good preventative for weeds. And I like to go ahead and get them in there early so that they hopefully maintain your weed pressure and you're not putting them in after you already have weed problems. Now the rate per acre in any of these uh, small farm ponds like we are talking about, um, we like to use a good ratio of about 100 largemouth to 500 bluegill or those sunfish that we were talking about. In any ratio, you could go with 100 largemouth and maybe do 
300 bluegill and, and about 200 red ear sunfish or the shell cracker. Uh, you could do 350 to 150 shell cracker. That really doesn't matter, but we want you to put more bluegill in there than you would the red ear sunfish. Um, you can also add 100 channel catfish. Um, uh, again, if you want channel catfish in there, you could put up to 100 along with this stocking rate. And again, this is per surface acre of water. And then uh, if you're just wanting to put cha channel cats in there only and you're planning on feeding them pretty heavy, um, you know, you could go up to a couple hundred, you might even put 250 or so uh, per acre of water on the channel catfish, but you would have to definitely supplement them with some feed if you don't put anything but the catfish only. We would usually recommend you put some bluegill in there with them as well. It would just be a better, a whole lot better relationship, predator prey. Now, some people ask me oftentimes, is it beneficial to uh, fertilize your pond? And the answer is absolutely. You definitely would want to fertilize if you have a fish pond. Uh, and again, I would consider this to be more new construction. Uh, we would want to do some a lot more talking if you've had an existing pond for a while because there's a lot of things that occur and that's at the bottom of the slide there on some of the risks of fertilizing. But let's just talk a little bit about fertilization. Um, you know, usually you would wanna start in our part of the woods somewhere around the middle of March or so and you would fertilize your pond. You could use a simple, a simple garden fertilizer or triple 15 if you wanted to use something like that. That's the most uh, readily accessible fertilizer for you. Put about 50 pounds or so of that particular uh, ratio of fertilizer in. You could also use something like 2025, um, about 40 pounds of that. And then 18460, there's a bunch of different types of ratios. Always understand that the limiting factor in your pond is going to be the middle number there, that phosphorus. That would be what you would want kind of the most of. And that's what your pond is going to benefit from. This is the limiting factor in most of our water in Tennessee or in this area. Uh, lime is also extremely important, and it's best to go ahead and lime that pond at the initial construction. That's the easiest way to lime your pond. Uh, a lot of people ask, can we lime the pond even after construction, after we got water in it? And the answer is yes, you can. It's just a lot more difficult, and um, it can be done, though, and it is highly recommended. Uh, a lot of our ponds, I think, in our area are just like a lot of our pastures sometimes where they have uh, kind of not been limed. They have, they, they lack uh, some lime or haven't been limed in a long time. And so I would recommend you think about that. That is that is extremely important in your pond. It's just like your lawn. If your pH is off, um, your grass isn't going to grow and the fish are going to respond as to a, a more of a neutral pH as well. So they're going to grow the best uh, as, as long as you're, you know, as long as you're not really acidic or or the opposite, you would want to be somewhere in the neutral on your pH. And lime is important in your pond for all of these things that we're talking about with fertility. Um, what happens when you fertilize your pond then, it gives it what we like to call a uh, more of a natural bloom. And so you're gonna get what we call a phytoplankton bloom. Uh, people call it, you know, the bloom when on their pond and it's a real pretty green color. It's like a pea soupy green pea color. Um, that's phytoplankton that the small fish, the bluegill, the shellcracker that we're talking about, when they're really small, that's what they're going to eat. It's kind of microscopic plants and organisms in your pond that is going to make them grow the quickest. And that's going to actually feed the largemouth to make them grow equally as well. And if you fertilize your pond, though, understand that if you've got weeds already in the pond, aquatic weeds, then you're feeding those weeds. So it's not a, a, a very good idea to fertilize when you know you've already got an existing aquatic weed problem. You need to take care of that problem first before you fertilize. Also, too, if you've got a lot of water moving through the pond, oftentimes when you fertilize, you're probably going to be fertilizing your neighbor's pond or the creek that's downstream or whatever. So you may not be getting the benefit if you got a lot of flow. And that going back to what I said with springs, when you got a spring in your pond and there's a lot of uh, water flowing through the pond, then oftentimes you're not gonna get the true benefit of the, fertil the fertilization uh, schedule that you might be on. A lot of people like to ask me, is it a good thing to feed fish? 
Um, one thing I would want you to consider is it is not oftentimes recommended that you feed a lot of fish. If you've got catfish in there, then that's okay. Uh, some people just enjoy feeding their fish and I don't have any problem with that. Oftentimes though, I see that people do overfeed their fish and that can become a problem. Uh, if you overfeed, put too much feed out in the pond, you can actually kind of start getting the fertility in the pond all messed up because a lot of that feed's got some nitrogen in it. Those fish are also going to process that feed very quickly and they're going to send that back out into the pond floor in the way of phosphorus. Oftentimes it's going to have a lot of phosphorus there so that could kind of screw up a lot of things if you're not careful. Um, I like to I like to see people feed their fish if they have some catfish in there and things, but always just feed them what they're willing to eat. Don't overfeed. And oftentimes people think, well, my fish are just not the size I want them to be. So I'm gonna try to feed them and make them a lot larger, make them bigger. And I promise you that is not the solution. It's not gonna work out for you, thinking that you'll help get them bigger quickly, more quicker. Um, this is probably the most, uh, uh, underutilized management tool in our ponds and that's harvesting our fish in our ponds and most of the time when I visit with folks in a face-to-face -face manner uh, from the standpoint of a big group kind of like we have tonight uh, the, the one thing I always like to ask them is how many people own a pond and then also too I always like to ask them how many people uh, consistently keep fish out of their pond and a lot of times very few folks actually keep fish out of their pond. And that's the most important thing you can do with these small little ecosystems because they are that, they're not a large reservoir like we would like to go fishing in on Chickamauga or uh, up your way, Old Hickory Lake or something of that nature. Um, these are different. They're gonna have to be managed that way and you are gonna be the top of the food chain. So it's important that you understand that they all these ponds have a carrying capacity. It doesn't matter if they're a half acre or if they're 50 acres, they've got a carrying capacity of how many fish they can actually, you know, withstand. How many, the, how many, what's the holding capacity in that pond? It's kind of like if you put a lot of people uh, maybe in a pickup truck, even if it's one of these four door pickups, you know, six people with two bench seats is probably enough. If you start putting eight people in there, 10 people, people start bumping elbows and get upset. The same thing happens in these ponds. They can get overcrowded and you have to be careful. So it's up to you to take those fish out. And so what you really want to have is, you know, you don't really want them, you know, if you're not gonna fertilize your ponds and, and really try to utilize them from the standpoint of you want a, a real nice, healthy pond that you want really large fish in all the time, probably about a hundred pounds per acre in an unfertilized pond pond is plenty of fish in there and you can see how quick it would take you know it it doesn't take long to get to that uh, that recommendation as far as your harvest then also too you would want to look at maybe about 400 pounds per acre in a fertilized pond so if you're fertilizing them and doing a real good job trying to really boost the ecosystem you know you're probably looking at about 400 pounds is what you would want to to be pulling out of there and so some fish are going to need to be harvested because you're if you don't, they're just going to be, they're going to, they're going to eventually become stunted. Uh, what they'll do is, you know, they, it's, it's a genetic thing too sometimes that winds up happening in a lot of these small ponds. And I think sometimes we get our ponds in such a situation that I don't know that there is a whole lot that we can do. We, I don't know that we can harvest enough fish out of them to really make a huge difference. And so that's a whole new day, honestly, and a new, and a different talk. A lot of people want to know, well, my fishing is not as good as it used to be. Why did it get so bad or why is it going downhill? A lot of times it's because maybe you're getting too many aquatic plants in there. And I know Mr. Upchurch was just talking about an aquatic plant that's in a, a big kind of a, a recreational lake that's up there in Cumberland County and, a, and a, an aquatic weed that he was talking about, you know, eventually uh, it might become a situation where that aquatic growth is taking over the pond and then actually making the largemouth bass more difficult for them to see, more difficult for them to reach out to or to get to uh, their prey fish, which would be those bluegill, those shellcracker that we were talking about. And also uh, when those aquatic weeds start to decay or die, they could also cause some fish kills. So that's something to understand is we can have some major 
fish kills, when those plants die in the fall or in the winter time, uh, you definitely can have fish kills as a result. We'll talk about fish kills more here in just a few moments. Oftentimes too, a lot of, a lot of folks have fishing trouble or their fishing kind of goes downhill because well, maybe they're only focused on one species in that pond and they're really wanting to catch bass and they don't really care a whole lot about the bluegill. They don't keep anything. They're just selectively uh, catching the bass. Maybe they keep one or two a year or a few ever so now and again. Uh, maybe they do the same thing on the brim side. They're, you know, they're only catching a few bluegill and that's all they keep out to, you know, a few of those or two or three of those or extremely one-sided and that's all they ever keep then that could cause some decline in the fishing. I guess, Keith, we'll just go ahead and take questions along. I'll stop right here and see if there's any questions so far before we move on to the next subject. That's kind of the basics of pond management. And we'll talk some more as we get into renovation. We'll kind of repeat some of this. Um, don't see questions? Don't see okay. as of yet in the chat box, but please type them in, uh, folks that are, if anything's, we touched on or Craig's touched on or didn't catch uh, here, you know, please uh, chime in, whatever, to get that question out. Sounds good. And as I said, I'm going to move through these pretty quick because there were several different topics that everybody wanted us to try to cover tonight. And honestly, I think I had about four hours here and we're going to condense it into one hour. And I promise you, I'll finish it right before seven or so. I'll give plenty of people, plenty, people plenty of time. But uh, as we talk about the management of that pond, that was kind of the construction phase and how to begin. This is kind of how to maintain it as we go along. And so I'll repeat a few things we have to do here, and that's on pond renovation. And some things that you really want to consider is we've already kind of talked about this, but you've got to maintain the, that balance in that pond. You've got to maintain the fish pond balance. And, and as we already talked about this, but you got to have three to five pounds of bluegill and red ears shellcracker for every pound of bass. So basically that one pound bass is likely gonna consume three to five pounds of bluegill or red ear sunfish, the, the, the sunfish in the pond probably per year. So each pound of bass is gonna eat about three to five pounds of bluegill and shellcracker each year. And so that's what you would have to have to kind of help you maintain that balance that we keep talking about. And um, also too, as we talked about, you need to really do a good job in harvesting those fish and keep good records, keep accurate records on what you're pulling out of there. And as I mentioned so many times already, that is the most important thing you can do is to try to keep a lot of fish out of these ponds. And a lot of people think that you can keep too many. And, and if it's a smaller pond, you definitely could. But I think oftentimes this is where I see our folks go wrong on managing their pond is they just don't keep enough fish. You know, when you're trying to manage and keep that fishery balanced, um, it's extremely difficult. It's really hard to do. And, and it really starts at the very beginning. It starts when you stock that pond. Uh, that's where you kind of manage. That's where you keep up with how to balance that system. And um, it really requires the pond owner themselves to, to do that. You can't depend on your neighbor. When you tell your neighbor they can come fish it, but I want you to keep everything you know, that person may or may not keep every single fish they catch that day. Um, so it's up to the it's up to the pond owner to manage that harvest and you got to keep up with it. And so, you know, it's best to probably think about, you know, that you, you, you know, you probably want to keep uh, a lot of fish per acre per year. And this will be probably about 100 bass a year and 500 brim per acre per year. And that's a lot of fish and people don't understand, you know, you wouldn't want to do that the very first year. Matter of fact, you probably wouldn't want to do it until about the third year on new construction. But if you've got an existing pond there now, you need to really start thinking about these numbers. It's a lot of fish that you really need to be keeping out of these ponds. And uh, again, that's per acre. And you can see real quickly how many of your family members you could feed very fast. So <clears throat> all these ponds have a carrying capacity in them, as we mentioned before. It goes back to that situation I was talking about. I sometimes use the elevator example where you can only get so many people in an elevator. And once you get them in there, you overload the elevator and it starts blowing horns and whistles and beeping at you and whatnot. The pond doesn't have a natural ability to do that from the standpoint of any noise. 
but visually it'll start giving you some signs. And we get a lot of calls. I know our offices at our extension offices, they call us a lot and they say, hey, I got a fish kill all of a sudden. Uh, the first thing I not, I don't purposefully do this in any harm, but I like to oftentimes say to them, you know, how often is it that you're keeping any fish out of here? Well, most of the time they say, well, we haven't kept any fish out of here in 20 years. Well, that's mother nature's way of telling you that you got too many fish in the pond. And so something's going to crash if you don't pull fish out. And I can't over, uh, I can't uh, uh, tell you this enough to let you know that harvesting is the most important management tool that you have as a pond owner and you have to manage that way. So in order to keep them from getting, from, from getting too many fish in there, you've got to keep fish out. And uh, again, you're probably looking at keeping about 100 pounds of bass and bluegill per acre out and about 400 pounds of uh, uh, bass bluegill in a, in a fertilized pond. Now, <clears throat> this is not a real good picture from the standpoint of uh, you know, I don't have a physical image here. I could have had you some, uh, but I thought this really illustrates exactly what we're looking for in a balanced system. You want all sizes to kind of be present. You want to see young of the year, which would be really small fish, probably the top right is real, real small, like a minnow size fish, uh, as well as you want to see medium sized fish and large fish of all sizes and all species. And that's extremely important to maintain balance. That's what you want to see. And if you don't see that every single, you know, not every outing, but most outings when you go, you look around, you know, start looking around the edge of the pond. When you go out to visit or you're out just drinking a cup of coffee in the morning, especially this time of the year, a lot of those fish are going to be up against the bank. They're going to be kind of hovered, hovering around the edges of the bank. And you can kind of see, you know, you don't have to catch them. You can see down in there kind of what's going on sometimes uh, just at the pond edge. Uh, but also, too, keep up with your catch records, kind of see what everybody else is doing. And, and uh, you can kind of tell if your pond is in balance from the standpoint of what sizes are you catching, what size are you seeing. Uh, you want to see and catch all sizes. So for uh, I keep reiterating that point. But again, for every pound of bass, you need to harvest three to five pounds of bluegill. And you don't want to fish the very first year we already made mention of. Um, the, the, the second, you know, the first full year, you can go ahead and maybe do some fishing in it. And, but it's, you know, better off to go ahead and put those all back in until about the third year. And then that's when you can probably really start getting into these harvest rules that we're talking about. And then you also too want to, you know, it's best not to go down there and, and just, Say you're gonna have a cookout or whatever for the weekend, July 4th is coming up and you wanna harvest 400 pounds out of the pond or whatever, don't do that all at one time. It's better to space that out throughout the season. Also understand that channel catfish do not reproduce and you're gonna be better off to um, make sure that, you know, you keep up with what you're pulling out because whatever you pull out, you're probably gonna eventually have to put back in sometime down the road in the future. It's important to really monitor your pond and make sure it stays in balance. Three methods that are probably the easiest for us to get a hold of and to use is just a seine, like a small seine, maybe a 20 foot long, maybe a five foot tall. A seine works really well. And we usually like to do that after all the spawn is over, which usually about the second or third, um, about, well, the, 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 in June, a lot of times by June, the bluegill have already kind of reproduced the second time, maybe, or the third time. They've already come off bed, possibly. And uh, so that would be a good time to think about using the same. Um, and then it's important, too, to just kind of figure out what you catch in that same. Usually you don't catch large, bat, uh, large, large mouth bass in that same because they're pretty smart. They know how to get around it. They hear you getting in the pond. But you should be able to catch some small, young of the year large mouth, some small bass and some freshly recently hatched bluegill and or shellcracker if those are in there. So uh, that's something you can do to kind of do what we call a little quarter haul seine trips. And um, that, that's something to think about. You can also monitor your balance just by fishing. We've kind of made that mention earlier. And that's just, uh, you know, whatever you catch, keep good records, kind of uh, maybe even take measurements or get a weight, whichever one, you know, you want to do. Most of the time you can kind of tell by just looking at them uh, whether or not they're healthy and whatnot. And just uh, fishing is a good way to kind of monitor your balance. 
And then we also have the ability to do some electro fishing. It's a very non-selective way to monitor pond balance. It's gonna basically get everything when you put that, what we call a shock boat in your pond. It temporarily brings those fish to the top um, and uh, it's the opportunity to be able to monitor those fish or just kind of take weights and measure them and whatnot. And then if you wish for us to, we can turn those back and they're gonna come back with no problem. So that's another way to be able to monitor pond balance. Keith, did we have a, have a question? Well, we got some problems that you're gonna talk about here in just a little bit about some okay. uh, wheat management. Um, yes, sir. Yeah, we'll get to it in just a few yeah. moments. We're almost, we're about, we're getting close to there right now here. Anybody just has, a little bit. Yeah, anybody has any other questions, put them in the chat, we'll get to them. All right. Uh, the other thing too is um, uh, sometimes, you know, when you think your fishing is not going so well, maybe you're thinking about how to, is it, you know, keep it in balance and whatnot. Um, some questions you should ask are basically, are my catching, you know, used to, I would go to my pond or whatever a couple, two or three years ago, and I would catch nice quality, three pound, four pound, five pound, large mouth. Now, for whatever reason, all of a sudden, maybe that's not, it's not happening that way. Or maybe some of your bluegill are, are just smaller than they used to be, or, or possibly a, a lot of the bass that you used to catch are getting, you know, they're getting smaller. Maybe they're getting, you know, there's, Sometimes we call it the big eye syndrome where those fish are real skinny and have big heads, have real big eyes or whatever. Um, maybe you're, you know, maybe you've even got some, some uh, fish in there that we would call maybe uh, the fish that we don't recommend you stock and that's uh, crappie or crappy uh, carp. Uh, maybe also some other fish species like gar have been introduced into your pond those would be things that might skew you out of balance. And so those would be things that could cause you some issues. We'll talk about some of those in just a moment. Um, oftentimes though, these ponds, again, it's because they're, they don't get harvested enough and they become overcrowded. So those average fish become smaller and smaller um, and they're basically competing for food. So they're not getting enough help. They're not getting enough nutrition. They're not eating enough in order to get large. And that's what makes them bigger, the better they eat. The more nutrient, you know, the more protein they get, they're just like a cow, the better off that they're going to do in that pond. So, um, you know, oftentimes if you have a bluegill crowded pond, you're going to see a lot of them. They're going to be probably a lot smaller. They're going to be skinny, kind of unhealthy looking. Um, some of them might even be just all larger or whatever. Um, and there's not a whole lot of smaller fish. Uh, you could see that, you know, it could be that your bluegill aren't able to spawn very well. They're not reproducing very good. Um, and so those are some issues that you might have. You might have too many bluegill. Um, the other thing, too, is you might run into a situation, and I, I don't see this one as much, but it, it does happen sometimes where your bass are crowded. There's too many in there. Um, and oftentimes they have real small bodies and a large head, like I mentioned before. We call them the big head bass, but they're only – you know, they're kind of skinny. They may look like they have a three pound, four pound head, a large head on them, but they only have like a pound body. And uh, that's kind of what we're talking about. These are some of the problem fish that you want to try to avoid them getting into your pond. And that's just at the top, we'll go from the top going straight down. Um, at the top, uh, basically is a green sunfish. And oftentimes they get introduced by great blue heron or some sort of shore, shoreline bird will come in and defecate eggs into the pond and you'll wind up with a green sunfish. Those actually can uh, reproduce with some of your sunfish that you put in and that can cause you some major issues. That's gonna get you out of balance. Common carp is the next one to your right. And that one basically, if it gets in there, then it's just gonna keep the pond stirred up and muddy all the time. And it'll even mess with beds, like if the fish are trying to go, go on the bed, largemouth are spawning, the carp are usually trying to spawn at the same time. And, It'll just mess the spawn up. So you want to avoid putting any common carp or goldfish, if you want to go ahead and put it that way. That would be a bad, you know, goldfish and the common carp are very similar. Uh, the crappie, which this one, you know, we'll call it the white crappie. It's not necessarily the best uh, ID picture that we have there for it. But basically, uh, you wouldn't want to put white crappie. You wouldn't really want to put black crappie in there either. But I would try to avoid putting crappie in there altogether. Uh, basically, the crappie becomes the predator species, and he can eat the bass. He'll eat it. They'll eat themselves. They'll eat all the bluegill. 
uh, they'll, you know, they'll eventually take over the pond and eventually all you'll have in there is crappie and then you'll have so many of them, they start competing with each other and they'll get smaller and smaller. And some people even think other types of species of catfish would be okay. Uh, but it's really not a good idea because um, some of these will try to reproduce. They'll keep the pond bottom stirred up. They'll eat a ton of fish, like a big bullhead or a flathead catfish. They can really do a lot of damage in your pond. So try to keep those out. Um, you know, sometimes when you look at um, uh, when you look at uh, how to renovate some of these ponds, uh, eradication of some of these species might be the best way to contain them. And if you've got some of these issues that we talked about, you know, you may have to look at just trying to pull a lot of fish out. And it might be a case where you get an electro fishing boat in there and try to catch as many fish as you can, or, you know, you basically drain the pond, try to draw it down, maybe use traps or seines or whatever it is. You might even have to use some sort of chemical to kill out everything and then try to start from scratch. If you're going with a chemical method, uh, we use rotenone sometimes. It's a old chemical. It's been around for a lot of years and uh, you need to really be careful with it. It is a restricted use chemical. Um, there's a lot of different kind of types. You can use a powder or liquid form. Um, you, there's a lot of kind of, you know, there's a lot of uh, label requirements. So I would recommend you really follow the label if you're going to try to do a rotenone. Uh, again, you'd have to have a, a you'd have to have a pesticide certification in order to even buy it because it is restricted use. But rotenone is uh, still a tool available to remove fish. It is non-selective, so it's going to take everything out. And uh, we don't recommend you eating any of those fish after you do a rotenone. Um, <clears throat> most of those fish are going to completely die within 24 hours. Um, most people do draw their ponds down so that you're not having to buy a ton of rope known because that could get expensive. So, um, you know, the best thing to do is to draw the pond down to a smaller area and then use that rope known as if that's something that you would have to do. If, if some of these other species that we talked about get in there and over time eventually take the pond over, you may be using, maybe having to be forced to use the rope known method. And um, that's something that, you know, you might have to consider. Once you do that, then you would look at restocking. And we've already talked about kind of, you'd go back to the same scenarios that we mentioned earlier, where you would start in the fall, maybe looking at stocking your bluegill and shell cracker, and then come back next spring and put your bass in. And um, obviously use, you know, the best of knowledge and good common sense when you're stocking, make sure the water temperature is not really high. And you wouldn't want to stock in the uh, mid part of summer anyway, because a lot of fish would probably not survive. Again, this is the stocking strategy, nothing different than we talked about earlier. Um, and again, 500 bluegill, or you could do 300 bluegill, 200 shell cracker, um, 100 largemouth, and about 50 to 100 channel catfish. All four of those species can go in that one acre pond. That's per surface acre. A lot of people call us about fish kills and um, <clears throat> Sometimes fish kills can be extremely difficult to diagnose. And um, oftentimes people ask us, what, what did cause this fish to die? You know, I, as I told you before, sometimes it's just a matter of, you know, you got too many in there possibly. And, and there's a lot of different scenarios that we could go through tonight. We could spend all night just talking about fish kills, but sometimes the fish are just getting older and maybe it's just one specific species that you see a couple of real big ones that are dead. Uh, sometimes maybe you might have a, a fish head up on the bank or maybe fish are being drug up on the bank. Maybe you got a river otter that got in there. So predation is something to consider. Also, too, you might even get a, a great blue heron to visit your pond often and they can really do a lot of damage. They can cause your fish, um, you know, you, you, most times they're going to take them with them, but uh, you could see some issues there. Diseases can sometimes happen, especially some sort of maybe viral, um, maybe infectious disease that you would get in the pond. Obviously that could happen and cause some fish to die. Uh, there could be some sort of environmental issue, maybe uh, somehow, maybe some sort of chemical gets put in there. Most of the time though, I see that oftentimes it's, some, it's something to do with dissolved oxygen issues. The dissolved, that dissolved oxygen in that pond, the level of dissolved oxygen gets too low and it's, too, it's low enough to where those fish cannot survive. And so that's something to think about, something to consider. 
Now, how can you tell what has caused those fish to die? Um, well, the best thing you could do would be to check the dissolved oxygen levels in that pond uh, while that fish kill is going on. And a lot of people don't have a dissolved oxygen meter and I understand that. Um, you might could possibly work with your local um, water utility or the local city water or something. Maybe they can kind of help you on the dissolved oxygen. Uh, sometimes they might work with you. Sometimes they may not be able to because of some sort of restriction that they have uh, privately or within their system. But you got to get that reading extremely fast. And most of the time, you know, you want to monitor what species and size of the fish that you see, what's dying, uh, because dissolved oxygen are going to kill the larger fish first. They need the most oxygen in the pond. So they're going to die usually quickest. But, um, you know, all sizes are going to possibly die with dissolved oxygen. But if it's a some sort of other toxic, like a like some sort of chemical that gets dumped in, usually it's going to kill the smaller fish first. They're going to die the quickest because they're up closer to the edge or to the top most of the time. And so, you know, toxicity is, you know, it's it, it can sometimes only get maybe the catfish. Maybe it's only affecting them. Um, but dissolved oxygen is usually going to kill, you know, it'll usually get everything in there. Um, you should also check for some other signs, like if the fish are kind of gulping, up at the surface, that's a good sign that, you know, they're not getting enough air, they're not getting enough oxygen. And so we would highly recommend that you would want to use some sort of aeration. This would be a good place to talk about it. Aeration is extremely important. Um, uh, I, I, for all practical purposes, I like to recommend more the, the diffuser type aeration system, which is, is basically you've got an air box on the side of the bank, on the pond bank, and you're pumping air into like a diffuser pad. And we can talk more about that if there's further questions. I don't have time to go completely into that, but uh, any type of aeration is a benefit. The diffuser system is probably the best that you can maybe get for fish for your pond, you know, if you got fish. Um, also too, um, you know, you should think about what has happened. What's the history behind it? Is, has it been bad weather? Um, and that's why maybe some of your fish are dying because, um, Hot weather, cloudy weather. Uh, obviously, if it's cloudy, there's no photosynthesis going into the water. You know, photosynthesis is not occurring. So um, cloudy weather can cause the lack thereof oxygen, dissolve oxygen. And those fish have to have oxygen, obviously, to survive. If it's real hot weather, maybe you got a lot of 90 degree days, water temperatures getting really up, the fish are getting stressed. Maybe even on top of that, we get one of these July, August storms where the Rainwater is kind of cool coming out of the atmosphere. It hits the 90 degree water. The temperature changes to like, you know, surface temperature maybe goes to 80 very quickly. And some of those fish get trapped. Those are some of the things that cause us some of these fish kills and some of the calls that we even get in our offices and some of the problems that you see. Also too, maybe you've got a heavy algae bloom and that algae dies all of a sudden. And when it dies, it, it basically starts taking the dissolved oxygen when, it, when those plants die they actually take the oxygen with them so they don't produce the oxygen anymore and it causes a reverse effect. Now, aeration is extremely important as we've already made mention of. Be careful if you're putting herbicides in for weed control, don't do any more than the label recommends and follow the label directly. Because if you don't do that, then you could cause yourself some major issues and cause a fish kill because of something like that. Uh, also too, it's important to understand when the best time is to treat with some sort of herbicide. This is a good um, a publication that uh, Tennessee Wildlife Resource Agency and UT Extension Office endorses called Managing Small Fishing Ponds and Lakes in Tennessee. You can actually, uh, you could just Google that, Managing Small Fishing Ponds and Lakes in Tennessee, TWRA, and it'll pull right up, or you can even go to our website, UT Extension, uh, and just go on the publications page and type in uh, fishing pond and it'll pull right up. And it's a very good publication. Everything we talked about tonight will be on there. I'm gonna talk about weeds and we're gonna go through this kind of quickly and I'm gonna mainly kind of hit the high points and I'm gonna let you ask questions in the end. But uh, aquatic weeds, is a major, major issue with a lot of our fishing ponds, probably 80% uh, of the questions that I get have to deal with weed control. And so a lot of times just understand that if you've got a pond, you're gonna have some weeds. So anticipate that you're gonna have pond weeds and that they could become a problem for you. 
You need to be able to identify them properly. A lot of our extension agents across the state are real capable of helping you identify these weeds. And you can also sometimes check in with your natural resource conservation uh, district conservationist. And uh, some of those guys and gals are real good at helping you to identify some of these and coming up with some control measures. There's also a real good website that I like called aquaplant.tamu.edu. And uh, that's Texas A&M. And they have a real good website that does a real good job at kind of spelling out what these weeds are, what they look like and how to control them. Now, in the construction phase, we didn't really get into a lot of this, but if you dig your pond, if you have somebody dig your pond, if you will construct the pond edges extremely kind of, as they drop off quicker, like two and a half to three foot deep, every foot or so that you move out, if you'll have deep edges, a lot of times you'll prevent a lot of these weed problems because it keeps the sunlight from penetrating the pond floor. The deeper those edges are, and the harder it is for the sun to get to the bottom of the pond, the pond floor, you'll help to reduce a lot of this problem that a lot of these weed problems that we have a tendency to see. Oftentimes too, maybe you got cattle that are drinking out of your pond and they're obviously defecating around the pond, possibly even in the pond. Those nutrients are a contribution factor. They're contributing to that weed issue. And so I've already mentioned sunlight. That's one contributing factor for weeds. Uh, definitely nutrients. They have to have you know nutrients to survive and uh, if you can kind of shade out sometimes, if you would shade or fertilize the pond to get that natural bloom, that phytoplankton bloom that we talked about, that's gonna be that soupy pea green color, that'll help shade out uh, the sunlight and prevent a lot of the weeds. Or you can sometimes put artificial shade in. I don't like to recommend artificial shade or dye, pond dye, when I have a fish pond because I want them to grow naturally. I want them to be able to eat the phyto, the natural phytoplankton that's there, that natural shade that we kind of call that phytoplankton. Uh, preventing with triploid grass, the triploid grass carp that we talked about earlier, that's also another thing to consider. And it's better, it's a better preventative, as I mentioned already. I would probably look at putting about five to 20 fish per acre if you know you're going to have a major weed problem or you already do have a major weed problem. You're probably somewhere in the middle there, about 10 per acre, if there's specific things. you know, I would recommend you read up about grass carp because they don't need every single aquatic weed that you might get in your pond. So you may have something specific in there and you're hoping they'll eat like algae. They don't eat algae at all hardly. So they're probably not gonna help you if, it's, if algae is your target plant. These are some of the problem weeds that we get a lot of questions about. I'm not gonna, verbatim kind of say all these. I don't really have a good, um, I don't have time to kind of share pictures of every single one tonight either. Uh, that's for another day or another talk. But these are some of the kinds of problem weeds that we oftentimes see. And uh, obviously some of these are surface type, emergent type plants. Some of them actually float. They're floating plants. And some of them are submergent type. So they grow on the bottom. And uh, like Southern Naiad, it's just gonna kind of creep along the bottom. It's gonna grow up maybe a foot, two foot, three foot. And you throw out your crankbait and you just get a bunch of that old bushy pond weed on there and it's just aggravating. So these are some of the problem weeds. Willows obviously are growing, cattails kind of on the edges of the pond. Willow can grow on the pond bank. And obviously they actually, their root system can take a lot of water out of the pond. So that's a concern. Uh, Philomenous algae is probably the biggest problem. The, the most calls that we get in our offices is about algae. And just understand that for the most part, you can grow algae in a mud puddle. And so prevent, prevention is the key. You should start that extremely early. I like to tell people to start looking for algae when the water temperature is about 52 to 55 degrees. And that's usually in our neck of the woods about February in your ponds. February, I want to look at how can I prevent algae from coming in now. And again, I said before, I don't like to use the shades, the colors, the dyes, but sometimes that might be your only method or your best method to prevent. But fertilization is a, is a good means. If you know you don't have any existing weeds in there, if you'll start a good fertilization schedule, you would have to fertilize starting in maybe say March. You want to fertilize in March, probably in April and May and June, July, August, September and October all those warm months when the water temperature is in the 60s. 
those are the times that you would do the, the fertility program and you would have to maintain that color all the time. When that color starts to go away, it's time to fertilize again. So when that soupy pea green color is leaving, it's kind of the color of my shirt actually. When that color is leaving, when it's, it's dissipating, when it's kind of going away, it's time to fertilize again. It means it's time to put more fertilizer back in the pond. There's a lot of things you can use to control algae. Copper is one of the most recognized ways, one of the, what the, the ways that we oftentimes, as far as any herbicide, this is a good method. Uh, you would wanna be careful because copper is toxic to fish. So be careful about that. And also make sure that your water is not running off into the creek or something. You be careful about treating, you know, just treat a, a section of that pond at a time, maybe a third of it or a fourth of it at a time so that you don't have a huge crash. All that algae dies at one time. Uh, also too, a lot of times when it floats up to the top, <clears throat> that's when people see it and that's when they wanna treat it. That's actually when it's starting to die. So you wanna break those mats up and make sure that your treatment, whatever treatment you decide, if it's copper, make sure that gets to the bottom. That's where the cop, that's where the algae is growing. And that's where you really wanna get, get the copper to. There's all kinds of different types of copper. There's chelated copper, which is like, the Q-Trine, it's probably one of the most common brands that you might see on the shelf. Q-Trine, Q-Trine Plus, those are usually a liquid or some sort of uh, granule form. There's also uh, a bunch of different other types of chelated copper, and those are some of the better ones to use. Uh, you could also use Reward or Diquat if you don't want to use any kind of copper. Uh, Diquat, you have to be careful with it, though, and don't put it in when the water's real muddy. There's also a lot of branched algae. They actually look like a plant, but they're actually, a, they're, you know, they're sometimes mistaken for a plant, but they're actually an algae, stuff like chara. It's got a real musky smell, maybe like garlicky smell. So that's something to think about. And we'll go through a lot of these others really quickly. Talk about some of the more common herbicides. Um, <clears throat> reward diquat, we talked about it a little bit. It's really good on some merch type plants. Um, there's also Aquathol or Super, Super K, we call it. Um, it's, it works really good as well on these submerged type plants, but it's a lot more expensive. And you want to be a little more careful with it. There's a, a product, a Floridone products that are out there. There's some generic ones out there now as well. Um, these are real good for, uh, you know, a, a bunch of different types of plants. So if you've got a, just a big uh, aquatic plant problem, just a bunch of issues with a lot of different plants. Um, this might be the best herbicide if that's the route that you choose. 2,4-D, um, there's a lot of different aquatic types of 2,4-D and a lot of these are real good with those plants that are kind of, their leaf parts are above the water and broadleaf type leaves like uh, water shield or primrose, smart weed. Those are some good weeds, target weeds that you could use the 2,4-D products on. The triclopyr products also are good for some of the same type plants, uh, but maybe you could add in like American lotus or alligator weed, the primrose and water lilies. Uh, glyphosate, which is the same product that might be in Roundup, they also make aquatic versions of you know different types of glyphosate <clears throat> that you can use. And it works good on like the willow, the shoreline type plants, uh, cattails as well. A lot of times people have trouble or they want to kind of kill a few of the cattails off. Flamoxazine is somewhat some new chemistry for a, 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 our aquatic, uh, in, our, in the aquatic uh, zones. And um, uh, there's two or three different types of uh, brand names of flamoxazine. But um, it's really good on like duckweed or like, a, like I was talking about earlier, water shield or some of these algaes that you want to put copper on. Uh, Flamoxin products are really good with some of those algaes. That's where we're going to stop. I know I kind of flew through those, but again, I would rather address some of your questions. It looks like we got four or five minutes. Keith, I'm going to stop right here. I think this is a good stopping place. Perfect. And you uh, answered a few of these, um, talking a little bit about the algae and some of the control there. And again, this is being recorded, so you can, you know, it'll be sent out to the county offices and uh, they'll have it posted on their Facebooks and websites and type things. So Tune back in if you missed one of those, uh, if you had a question about that. But we do have some other, uh, and I'll, uh, I'd like to bounce these off of you, Craig. Yes, uh, sir. And, I, and I've thought, uh, and I and this, I remember this in the past and everything, I used to encounter these things. What the, we this person has, we have some types of, you know, leech in the ponds and really deters wading or swimming. 
what would yeah. you recommend to do there? Oftentimes, Keith, I find that um, <clears throat> they've got a lot of maybe leaf matter or just a lot of muck. Uh, maybe there's even some brush and things in that pond. And if they'll start thinking about cleaning up some of that muck, there's some different muck tablets and things of that nature. I don't have any specific brands that I like to give you because we don't usually focus on brand names today, but there's like muck away products or muck control. Uh, that, that would be one way I would start. And then also too, if you've got any brush, like old brush things that's falling down in the pond, try to clean a lot of that out and that'll help you kind of get rid of some of that. Also too, a good thing to think about is to stock that red ear sunfish, the shellcracker fish that I was talking about, because it'll start feeding on those parasites and uh, they're not going to get them themselves. They're just going to eat them in a juvenile stage and it'll help you prevent some of that. So that's the short answer. That's good. Thank you. I um, also asked this and I kind of answered it, but I'll let you, uh, what is the saying? It's yeah, it's a net. Basically it's a, it's going to have a, it's, I should have had a, I could have had a picture up of one today. I should have, actually I had one. I took it off and put Ronnie's picture on there and he'll be tickled to death that he got his picture on here today. So he paid me well for that, but it's just basically a, a real long net. It's got two poles on either side. And so one man gets on one side of it, one on the other. And basically you can kind of, it's, it's also got, I should mention this for sure. It's got weights, lead weights at the bottom, all the way across the bottom of the, of the string that goes from pole to pole. And at the top, you've got floats. And so you would take that seine or that net and basically kind of do some sweeps. And that helps you kind of determine, have you had a good uh, hack of small uh, fingerling fish? So that's kind of what you're looking for when you use the seine. So that's a great question. I apologize for not explaining that. Good. Um, another one I've caught mostly, uh, I've caught mostly uh, eight to 10 inch largemouth bass how can i get bigger bass i think you kind of touched on that but if you yeah maybe so it's probably a situation where your bass crowded more than likely and you're going to have to start harvesting a lot of those even those smaller ones i would start going ahead and kind of pulling some of those out and uh, you know bass are extremely good to eat people don't understand they're even in the lake out of all the species in the lake bass is one of my favorite species to eat they taste really good they have a real white flesh it's really good to start eating some of those fish out of there. And a lot of times we have a, the wrong mentality that everything should be catching and release in our ponds, but that is extremely the opposite of what you would want to do. And I know I really banged harvesting a lot tonight, but that is that was the key take on this. You need to take a lot of those out, start pulling them out. That's a big, important thing. All right. Another, what about mallard, ducks, or geese? Will they eat fish? Um, they don't eat any fish, but they are a little bit of a problem because what they will do is, I like to start with this one. This probably doesn't hinder some people, but they eat a lot of the grass on the edges of the pond. So they'll cause some major erosion. Plus they eat, and I'm just going to keep this sane, but they eat and they poop, okay? So all that's going into the pond and you're going to cause yourself some issues from the standpoint of uh, you're going to get a lot more phosphorus out of that where they defecate you're going to overload your pond with more nutrient than you need. The other thing they do is, Keith, is they bring in weeds from your neighbor's pond, aquatic weeds that you're trying to keep out of your pond. They're going to bring them to you. So duckweed is a good example, hence the name duckweed. Uh, that duckweed attaches to your Labrador retriever. If he jumps in the water, he's going to have that duckweed all over him too, okay? Same thing with ducks. It gets on their backs. It gets on their feet. They fly from your neighbor's pond to your pond. And then next thing you know, there you start that whole cycle yourself. And so I, I would recommend that you try to keep waterfowl to a very minimal. I, I, I don't even like any if you can maintain that ratio, but that's up to you. Some people really like to see them and that might be a part of their management plan. Gotcha. Um, I think you talked about this in your construction of your ponds. That I think tips for small pond that's losing water leaking. And I think I talked to you about a producer earlier in the year. Yeah. And, and I apologize, um, we may have even tried to hit ponds or pond leaks tonight. I don't even know if that was on my list. I don't think it necessarily was because that's really a whole new talk again, but uh, leaks are dip difficult. I would probably look at the bentonite product. It's uh, like a clay material that expands three times its size. Um, you would do a little research on bentonite. It could possibly help you. I would recommend that you definitely follow the instructions on the bag and or 
label product, whatever you're able to get, because it is specific on how to use that product. And if you don't follow the directions, you're basically, you're probably at a loss if you don't follow the directions on that product. So. Awesome uh, questions. Yeah, it is. One last, um, unless something else pops up here. And uh, we talked about maybe a little bit uh, early in, as we were introducing you, uh, this uh, gentleman, can we have Craig come to our lake for a visit assessment dinner? And I was saying you met, you have the, the <laughs> yeah, dinner. I like to, I'll, I'll join yeah. you. Uh, but you, he knows uh, how to get our attention, doesn't he? Right. So the uh, but I, you know, we talked about uh, you know a few years ago having a little field day. There yes, sir. Around, so I'd like to do that again up here in our area. But yes. uh, you might address how you do that that process. Yeah, we'd be happy to do that. Um, we actually are kind of working on. Uh, I guess I go ahead and let the cat out of the bag. We're kind of working on some new tools uh, that Extension is going to have available for us, and we got some electro fishing boats. Uh, a few of them that we're kind of putting together for our regions. And so um, I'm actually doing a little bit of kind of helping out some folks uh, up your way, Keith. I think Jason was on here earlier. We're gonna be in Overton County uh, one day at the end of this week and kind of do some assessments that way. So if folks are interested in that, get with your local extension office, talk to your county agent. Uh, we'd be happy to schedule that, but we would prefer you to go through the local extension office because that helps us all and we want everybody, we want the proper chain of command. We want everybody that needs to be there present uh, when we decide to do that, if that's something that y'all wanna do. If it's something that you wanna do, I'm more than happy to participate and, and help as I'm, able, as I'm available to, and uh, we can definitely try to schedule that. Very good, and that's- a, Happy that's, to do it. That was a great uh, day we spent doing that. I mean, it was amazing some of the things. We did some weed control and then the, the you know, fish kind of a population and that type of thing. Um, we have yeah, little thoughts. field days. Yeah, we have some other agents on here. Again, uh, producers, landowners, you know, uh, I won't, I'll miss everybody if I go through there, but several in our Upper Cumberland. Uh, appreciate Chris Hicks for uh, setting this up. Chris is on here and he might want to introduce maybe the June. We have a, each month we do this Ag Talk Tuesday. If you've just, uh, this, this is your first one, uh, usually a different talk ever every month. So, um, you know, uh, you'll gain something hopefully by joining us and uh, just stay in tune with your extension office and hopefully we'll have your information and we'll get that, uh, you know, the future meetings to you. But Chris, you want to introduce maybe anything of a June topic or then we'll wrap up? Yeah, I think we're uh, going to talk about backyard poultry. I think we've had to change that date. So if you had that, if you'd already signed up for it, I think it's been changed to June the 29th. So with the last Tuesday in June, but uh, Kristen Rich up in Clay County, which they raise a lot of poultry on a big scale, big commercial scale, but we're gonna be talking about the small backyard flocks. So uh, I know we have a lot of a lot of folks that have those backyard flocks. So I think it'll be interesting to you. And uh, we'll try to send everybody an email invitation that was on this Zoom. So we'll, uh, we'll email you with that link where you can register. Thank you, Chris. Chris. Chris, is there anything you can do about my guineas? They're a little bit too loud. I just want to see if you can keep them toned down a little. Will y'all talk about I think you're probably playing the wrong kind of music. You need something, maybe some smooth jazz for them. Calm them down, Craig. But uh, looks like uh, we're we're look, just past a little bit of 7 p.m. here. Uh, we usually stick around an hour, but we do thank Mr. Craig Kimbrough, uh, County Director down in Grundy County and our pond and uh, fish specialist in our central region. We are proud to have him. And again, uh, have any questions, uh, you know, something spurred, uh, you know, a question about this or something else around your home or farm, contact your extension office. They can get with Craig or they can, uh, they can answer the question themselves. So that's why we're here. And so we hope to see you all in June. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Keith. Thank you, Craig. I enjoyed it. Thank you a whole lot. And I really enjoy visiting with folks about ponds. I know I flew through all that tonight, and I'm more than happy to get more detailed talk sometime with anybody that they wish to reach out to us. You're great. Thanks.